in the Star on YouTube. All right, so today we're doing biogeography and phylogeography. Okay, so what do we want you to learn from today? Uh, what's continental drift? The difference between dispersal and vicariance? Some major, major biogeographic events in life? What phylogeography is? Which is the thing from biogeography? Some of the perils of methods? Okay, so it's like how we do science, how we, how we develop tools to do science? And then some of the uses of phylogeography. All right, but first, a quick clicker question. And by the way, the last one, it wasn't recording properly, so I gave everyone full credit, um, whether you're here or not. Um, but here you can take this channel 41. Ten more seconds. And correct, rotifers. Why are daylight rotifers cool? Other than not being extinct. So they only have one sex? Isn't well, the, yeah, they're, they have to be asexual. Right? So they're a metazoan that hasn't had sex for tens of millions of years. Um, which makes them surprising because we think about, we'll, when we get to the sex part of the course, we'll talk about how it sort of helps you escape parasites and things like that. And so it's kind of weird that they can survive for so long. Um, without this. Okay, good. Uh, next question. Ten more seconds. Okay, and done. Oh, okay. So let's talk. So talk to your neighbors about this. All right, and then we're giving you a do-over on the clicker too, so you can retake the quiz. <laughs> oh, now you care. <laughs> Yeah. We're, we're instinctual beings here, obviously. 
think it's <laughs> directionality of evolution which sounds great. Yeah. I don't know if that's right. Yeah. I still don't know if yeah. the basal really means. Well, what do you think about it? Yeah. So, Alright, so enter your, enter your answer. Like clickers, are, clickers are good. They can see, like, oh, I haven't taught you that well yet. Let's go back over it. <laughs> we haven't studied well. Yeah. All right. You remember we took it? Yay. <coughs> um, sorry. It was. It is. It is this one. 52. Okay, why though? So why is it not A? So let's say why not A? What's to have not bias? Right. And so, so what do I say? What's reading a tree? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So if we have this some um, unrooted tree, and I want to say where the common ancestor is for everything, right? So if I say it is here, then I can redraw it as that group sister to that group. Make sense? Okay. And so, if I are talking about bias, right? Because, I mean, it doesn't, how does that deal with, you know, fossil bias? Could just be modern organisms. Okay, why not C? Yeah. Well, it roughly says the same thing as B, but it's backwards. So it's not showing you where it's going to. It's telling you this is where it started. Right, so like B shows you the direction, right? So we've gone from here this way, right? Here this way. It could have been if the root were here, then the tree is um, the tree is this tree. A very different history of evolution. Okay. And not C because you know taxa on modern taxa aren't basic. Right? You could argue that you know, this taxon is sort of based with everything else, um, but in practice, I mean, you don't actually identify this individual, you know, ancestor. Okay, so it's not C. Okay, so B is the right answer. Does that make sense? If not, ask more questions. You can, you know, push you on again. Yeah. C. So. The only people to think about basal taxa, they're actually talking about something like this. It actually switch to everything else. Right? But that's, I try to show that that's not a useful term that can be misleading. Right. Though you're, I mean, technically, this taxon is sort of based with everything else. But, yeah. So when would be an appropriate, helpful term to use to use basal taxa? <laughs> Um, and some people do, and it's fine. I mean, if, if, if it's clear that they know that it's not like the, uh, the problem is when people use basal taxonomy in this, and they assume it's primitive. Right? So if you have, you know, a systematist who knows what she or he is doing, you know, they know that this isn't, you know, the ancestor here isn't the same as this one. Right? But oftentimes, you know, casual speak, I mean, there's actually, actually a nature article last week that used basal taxon and thought that the basal taxon was most primitive. And so, it can be the mistakes that way. Yeah? So it seems to be one of the Ah, so yeah, sometimes we say early diverging lineages, right? Okay, so at this split, which lineage diverged first? But they diverged at the same time, right? Their sister. So early diverging is the same issue with basal because you have, you know, 
you know, why is this path privileged over this path? Right? They didn't identify a thing. These four. Yep. But okay, if you had a buffalo, all right, you had a buffalo, and then you have a massive earthquake, and a giant valley, multiple models, and a buffalo, etc. Uh huh. Okay. Then I have multiple buffalo. What is one buffalo that retains all the three traits that it had previously, and the other one is going to change? Ah, good point. So we're going to come back to this when we talk about. Punctuated equilibrium, okay, which is an idea from Eldridge and Gould. Um, and so is the idea that when you have evolution, you have speciation events, one thing doesn't change at all. The other thing changes a lot. And then stops again. Right? And then another speciation event, one changes and one doesn't. Um, and so they have to put a pattern like that. And <coughs> in that case, we still think about it as, I mean, the, the history of the populations, in terms of a time history, is still, right, that's the time history. And what you're thinking about is just the traits. And so we have multiple traits evolving here and multiple traits evolving here. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so you might have trouble distinguishing this one from this one. Right, um, there's thought to be if there's a serial a, a different species. This goes in paleontology sometimes when you have you know, something that has changed and something else that has changed. So how do you consider the future? Well, okay. Right, so we think of species as sort of independent evolutionary lineages, right, rather than morpho species, which is like just things that look the same. If we're doing a morpho species concept, then yeah, you would group them together. If you're doing a concept of independent evolutionary lineages, which is what most people are think, you know, think uh, they're doing now. Yeah, it's good, good clarification. So, yeah. so the tree then is just pushing back this tree. It's histories of populations um, or species. And I can talk about today, later today trees of pop, that do you know, populations rather than just species. Right, so you can have a tree of humans, where right? all one species perfectly interfertile, right? But we have you know, different, you know, some groups, some of us went to Asia, some of us went, down to, went to Europe, some of us went to you know, Australia. And so those different population histories can be shown as a tree like structure. Even though they could still be integrating throughout, and now it's also integrating. Yeah. Good. Other questions about this? Yay, clickers. All right. So, turns out continental drift. So, in 1912, Alfred Wegener proposes continental drift. I'm not going to ask you the date, I'm just giving you the date for context. Okay. Um, <coughs> and Here's you know, how science works. So, reaction was almost uniformly hostile and harsh and scathing. Right? This is a crazy idea. Right? Like, oh wow, look, yes. Friends look sort of similar. Now they're moving all over the place. I right? don't feel them moving. Right? Um, <coughs> and you know, we have this you know, very competing ideas about how things got around. Right? Um, but now we have lots of evidence for this. So, first of all, now we can actually measure it. Right, so we can measure distances very precisely, so we can see these kind of is moving an inch apart a year. Sort of thing. Right. Um, <coughs> there's also geomagnetism. Who knows what, who knows what this story is? Geomagnetism story. Yeah, so the Earth, we have, a, we have a shield around us, 
right, caused by a magnetic field. And so the aurora is when charged particles in the sun get directed to the north and south pole and hit our atmosphere and start glowing, right? But periodically, we turn off that shield and switch its direction. Um, and so what used to be, you had a compass, you know, what used to be going north now changes and points the other way. Because even today, our magnetic field is shrinking. It's getting slightly weaker, right? Maybe, we're gonna, maybe it's going to flip soon. We don't know. But scientists still don't know. can't really predict why that happens. Um, but it does. And so when you have a seafloor spreading, like you have in the mid-Atlantic, right, you can go in, when rocks are molten, if they have crystals that align to magnetic fields, they'll point like little miniature compasses that then get frozen and the rocks solidify. <coughs> and you can look on opposite sides of the seafloor spreading and find, you know, you can go north, you can go north, you can go south, you can go south. And so you can find these bands that are, you know, symmetric on both sides of why would it be symmetric? Ideas? Right. Right? It's spreading from here. And so here you have more rock, and then it's rock from the same time, and it's pushed out by more rock, and more rock, and more rock. It's just that rock is spreading out there. Okay. And so some of the evidence we have for um, continental drift. Okay, there's also, also lots of fossil evidence we talked about last time. Good question. So there was, there's this really weird fringe theory that like, called expanding Earth. This is the Earth itself is getting bigger through time. We don't think that's happening, right? Um, but what you think about it, it's coming up from somewhere to be going away somewhere. So, good. And so, <coughs> you think about, you know, the Ocean Ridge that's spreading out, right? Well, make a new crust, but then it's the other crust. And sometimes it can go down. Right, so here we have two plates colliding, and one sucked up and under the other. Right? And then it melted, melted back into the magnet. And so things are moving around, but the overall area doesn't change. Yeah. Oh, great question. So one of the things that Darwin was upset about was um, his idea of evolution requires lots of time. Right? People said to him, well, you know, Lord Kelvin, that Kelvin, like the degrees, um, it's calculated that like the Earth is this, you know, very hot body cooling down. It can't have been cooling for that long because it would all be all solid. You know, it's not all solid all the way through, right? So you require lots of time, but we know from the heating, from the Earth, fact that the Earth is melted in the middle, that's have been formed pretty quick, pretty recently, right? And so how do you reconcile, you know, a short-lived Earth with long time for evolution, right? And what Lord Kelvin hadn't taken into account was radioactivity. And so radioactive decay inside the Earth's mantle is warming the warming the Earth. And so <coughs> the reason it hasn't cooled down all the way is because it's generating new heat due to radioactive decay. So it's still it's still cooling. Um, but the heat, you know, the, the radioactive, you know, the the fission is keeping it warm. Does that answer your question? Right. Well, I'm sure, maybe it's steady at this point, I'm not sure. If it's steady or it's still cooling. Right. Yeah. Right, but I mean, you can imagine, so there's two processes happening. So, one is you have the Earth, you know, cooling with black, black body radiation. Right, so that's, you have that. You have... Actually, the sun giving some energy, which is a constant rate of fluctuations. And then you have, so it's three processes, actually. And then you have the radioactive decay that's generating heat. And yeah, at some point, that's going to, that's going to taper off as, you know, we use up the compound, the, the elements that are undergoing this decay. But I'm not sure what the, time, the timeline for that is. And since we only have, you know, it's like a billion or so years until the sun expands to kill life, But yeah, that's a good point. Um, you can imagine, in you know, short time period, you could be pretty much near steady state. It's still decreasing a little bit because of the radioactive decay. But I mean, something when they radioactively decay, then they can decay again. But you have a chain reaction. 
it could be that at first you have things that take a while to decay, and then the decay into things that are more decay faster and actually make it warmer, and then finally run out of gas. So, yeah. Good. Other questions about this? Yeah. Does the rotation of it keep it um, warm too? No. Um, not not our Earth. Yeah, yeah. Not. Um, the, the pause was because there's some moons of Jupiter where the, you know, the tidal forces of, you know, Jupiter always pulling on it as it rotates creates, you know, some sort of pressure that keeps it warm and sort of pumps, like Io, shooting volcanoes in space and stuff like that, is powered somewhat by that. Um, I don't think with Earth that it matters much, not the tidal force of the sun. Yeah. The moon might have a non-zero effect, but I mean, we take that for matter now. Question. Any other questions about this? Okay. And so we have <coughs> the earth going away, and when plates meet, you know, they're sort of a little flexible, right? And then they get crumpled. Right? We call these crumpled mountains. Right? <coughs> so India right now is slamming into Asia, right? If you look like the reconstructions of continents through time, India is just taking off, bang. Right? And so, um, not every instrument that that one, they're going up still as in the equator. Okay. There are also volcanoes that occur in the middle of plates. Right? Um, and and there are other volcanoes that create that boundaries. And of course, plates lead to earthquakes, too. And so you can figure out where plate boundaries are for mapping where earthquake, earthquake epicenters are. Right? Because when plates move, then they get stuck, right? And eventually, they release that pressure suddenly. And that's an earthquake. Yeah. Right, so there's different kinds of plates. So some move toward each other, some move parallel to each other, some are moving apart. Yeah. I don't know uh, the ones moving apart have earthquakes, but the other ones have earthquakes. Right. California is actually plates moving, the Pacific plates moving north, and the North American plates are not. And so they're sliding by each other. Yeah. More cool Darwin stuff, at least in South America. Um, so Darwin like, went on one big trip and never left home again, basically. But his one big trip was like a five year voyage, it was cool. And we'll talk about it more later. But he, you know, was in South America during earthquakes, you can see, like, you know, clams and stuff that have been raised up out of the sea from the land going up during an earthquake. Plus, it was dying because you know, the sea level was different because of how things moved up and down. So, sometimes it can cause like dramatic changes you can see in, in your lifetime. Any questions about this? So, if yeah. it's moving apart, wouldn't it either at the other end, wouldn't it have either subject or sliding to another place? Mm -hmm. So, yep. it would cover that way. Yep. Right. So, that, at that, that, that edge, it would. I'm not sure about at the edge where it's pulling apart, it would have any place now. Other questions? And so, we have to think about how, you know, this, the movement of things affects biogeography. Right? So imagine I have here a land area, and it separates, which could be due to sea levels going up, and so this part's lower, and so the ocean goes through there. It could be due to, you know, this either from continental certain places in the part, and then you cause that. And then what we think happens is you have, um, you know, forming. So we can see here, the sea plumbing is A and A and A, but we would go to your question earlier, but probably call this the NPT at this point. So it's completely called this. And so we have notice to put here, and then finally we have you know, dispersal, and we place it in the right? column. And so when things are split by the thing they're riding on getting split, that's called the carrots. Okay? And when it's caused by and leave someone else, it's called dispersal. Okay? And there's been religious wars in biogeography about the carrying force of dispersal. Okay? And <coughs> um, there's always thought that you know you'd always have lots of dispersal, and so you'd have these like land bridges would appear between you know North America and Europe because you can walk over. Right? And the land bridge disappear again. Or to Hawaii, the land bridge appear, whatever. Okay. Um, where's the dispersal list? And so there's versus the carrions. And so there's still a bit of fighting, but I mean now 
most biologists would say that there's no book process happening. Right. <coughs> we can see clearly certain areas where it is definitely the carrying and areas where it's definitely dispersing. And so we have methods to understand this. They don't want you to know the, the, the depth process we go through for this, because we've integrated method. Basically, you can <coughs> take these scenarios and you can figure out the one thing I could have had was, you know, I was in area A, area A, and move to area B, and I'm in area A, B, and then this one becomes area A, and then becomes area B. So I have one dispersal and one dispersal. Yeah. I don't think that's known. Um, it, it depends on what causes speciation, um, which is also a big discussion, right? So, when is drift most effective? happen fastest. Small. Right? Small population size. So if drift is what's driving speciation, then dispersal probably has a faster rate because you have small population size. But if selection is driving speciation, that's going to affect even a bigger population size. And so you could have selection for different breeding systems and things like that, and then in that case dispersal would uh, the vicariance would have a faster rate. But that's something that's worth checking out as a research program. Other questions? Okay, so here's one scenario. Another scenario that's always an A, B, and then we lose the two times. Right? In other words, always A, B, and then we lose B and gain A. Right? This is many possible scenarios, and with this, we just, with this approach, we just use parsimony. It says, okay, which has, which has the fewest number of changes? But of course, there are model based ones too that are based on the probability of change, how long things have been evolving, that sort of thing. Thank you. Any questions about this, though? So, tunnel drift. So here we see Lake Triassic, right, 2.3 million years ago. Right, and here's the world. So where are you on this? Well, I can't tell yet, right? That's mm -hmm. um, move forward and we'll see. Okay. So then early Jurassic, right? And then early Cretaceous. Right? And you see, this is in the sea as well. Right? And finally, KT boundary. Right? So, boom. Right? So we think there was a large asteroid impact in the Yucatan Peninsula at that point. Okay? And so forth through time. So it was the birth time. Right? But look here at India. So once you said years ago, India is right over here. Why does that matter? Why does knowing that India, you know, came from, if you look back, follow India back now, you know, just like a shell game, move the ball. Okay. So, where's India coming from? Antarctica, India, Gondwana, the sort of southern continents. Here, called Gondwana, right? So it came from there. And, then even 65 million years ago, it's right here. Um, why does that matter? Why do we care? Exactly. So, so sorry, sorry, say again. Right. So these are evolving sort of independently. Right? So you know, think about, you know, we have species now that you know go from Africa into Europe and vice versa, right? But at this point, you know, this is as isolated as Australia is or South America was. Right? So you have entirely different ecology here than here and here. Okay? And also, the species the relative three species probably. Okay? Well dead, but the, the ones that aren't dead. Yeah. They're made in Madagascar. 
maybe Africa and the one that this one is connected to, right? And so, you know, when you're at LA Leeds, writing and touching leads, right? So interacting with things that haven't been seen haven't each other for you know, tens of millions of years. Okay? So think about invasive species now, right? We care about kudzu, we care about um, various kinds of invasive fish, I mean, they matter, right? Now imagine having an entire continent's worth of invasive species hit. We have, you know, these can get here, these can get here. Right? This will have a huge effect on the ecosystem. Oh, so that's the different thing. So, um, yeah, anytime we have a ball, we try this. I mean, imagine skinning an orange, right, and trying to put it flat. Well, you, you can't really do it without stretching certain parts or causing cracks and things like that. And so, different ways we have of depicting things. I mean, think about, you know, so this part here, right, it's pretty small in the blue. But on a simple, simple map, you have to sort of spread it out so you can compute. But you look for a giant thing. Right? And so there's different kinds of map projections. And so map geeks, you know, have dozens of different projections, some that, you know, show areas accurately, but then stretch things out. Um, some that are good for navigation, where you can plot, you know, this way you can move from here to here, you can plot this course. And so, yeah, some maps actually are upside down, both how we normally do it. It's probably five feet towards the top, it's good or something, but it's the map, you know, it up. And so, <coughs> it's a whole world of how to understand that's a map um, and it matters for this too because when you think of how far apart are these, well, that depends on your projection, right? I mean, there's, a, there's a true distance. You don't know what to understand it intuitively. You know, how far projection. Other questions? <coughs> All right, so let's look at a case study. Okay, what are these? Lemurs. Or we call lemurs. All right, and where do they live? Madagascar, right. Okay. So here's Madagascar. Right, so here's part of Gondwana. Right. Over here. Right. Here's the side of India. Right. That's the fish from India. Okay. So it hasn't touched Africa for a very long time. You know, hundred years ago, it was still separate. Right? And so how can we tell if and the, the closest relatives to the lemurs are in Africa? How can we tell where they disperse, whether it was vicariance or dispersal? What would be evidence for it? Yeah. Okay, how does how is a phylogeny of time help? Exactly. So if the split were 252 million years and 135 million years, it suggests that it could have been due to vicariance, right? So we had one population here, and then we separated them in one way and another way, right? It doesn't necessarily guarantee that, but it's just it. So if we see that, you know, they're, they're, you know they diverged from each other you know, 6 million years ago, that suggests that they had to cross this water boundary. And so what's the answer? Why? Yeah. 
So probably this bristle with one caveat. Well, two caveats. One, rarely equal to, right? So sometimes with dating, you all you get is a minimum age. It could be that this is much, much older. Okay, probably not in this case, but who knows. And the other caveat is it could be that there's some sort of connection with these men, right? So maybe the math itself here is wrong. And so that's something to think about, too, because these are, these are reconstructions, and if sea levels were much lower, maybe they're connected. But right, I mean, given, this, given the evidence you have, it's strongly suggests dispersal. Yeah. Oh, and so there's several, several lines of evidence, right? So there's, um, you can look for when things are connected. You should see the same sort of rock formations inside. And so between like, you know, Eastern, like, Eastern, like Maine and Africa, there's actually rocks you can, you can match up between Maine and Africa. And that's some evidence for it. Um, you can look to see how, if you have molten, you know, solidified rock, if the igneous rock then has magnetic things, you can see what the ancient orientation was. All right, so I can do some direction there. The other evidence too, I'm not sure what all the evidence would be. Good question. Other questions? This is the most active class I've ever had. This is great. Okay. Um, so invasive species gone wild. The Great American Biotic Interchange. People tell you a million years ago. Okay? So South America was like Australia. You know, separate from Gondwana, like Australia did, and just sort of cruising on its own. Right? While North America was you know, touching and not touching Asia. Right? And then they connect. And then you get this spread of <coughs> South American mammals, great animal, animals in North America, right? and North American animals in South America. And so if we think of those traditionally South American animals, like llamas, actually didn't get in South America until you know, two and a half million years ago. Right? And then the relatives that were in North America went extinct. They're down there. Okay? And inversely, things like armadillos came north. Okay. Yeah. Oh, on this, it's showing my house. No, no. It's showing the switch. It's showing the switch. It's showing like North so America, these are the ground ones. Spots from South America. Exactly. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Peccaries. And then eventually humans came in and gave. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so, you know, so this shows a connection, how things happen in connection, but it's also good to think about. And so, well, on land is for projection, on water is now a barrier, right? And so we can look at that barrier, see up in there. And so here are uh, snapping shrimp, right? And we find a bunch of the sister species where they look very similar to each other, but they don't have to breed anymore because they're separated by this isthmus. Okay? And actually, there's some cool evidence that those that, you know, live at deeper depths or have their larvae dispersed at deeper depths, um, separate speciated first. Because you know land bridges coming up, right? Those are blocked first, and then later the shallower ones get blocked. Okay. So it's you know speciation event caused by this land bridge. Questions about this? So this is a clearly a vicarious event right, caused by land appearing. Okay. Island biogeography. So have people covered this in past classes? Yes? Okay. Um, right, so the cool thing is dynamic equilibrium. Right, where things that are, you know, land masses that are closer you know, have more integration from the mainland. Ones that are smaller have higher accretion rates. Okay. And actually, Dan Simberloff is in this department. Um, one of the reasons he's famous is from some early work he did on this, where he took these small mangrove islands and these exterminate counted all the all the insects and vertebrates on there, put extermination tents around them, killed everything, right? and then watched things recolonize. As you can see, you know, this is predictable, you get the same same diversity back, same species back. You typically get the same sort of diversity back, but not the same the same species. So this is dynamic look, trade cool result. Any questions about this? Okay, 
So Wallace and Lyon related. Right? So after Russell Wallace, um, who also discovered natural selection, right? I'm not Darwin sort of trying to just, you know, look at know about his ideas. Um, just cover it later. Um, did a lot of exploring in this area of the world. And he noticed that lots of animals and, and for birds and mammals east of this line were sort of they were put relatives over here, and then west of this line put relatives over here. Even things that, you know, separate between you know, Bali and Milma, very close. You know, those relatives aren't on the nearby islands might be over here. And why might that be? And so what we now think the reason is because you know, deep channels separate them. So over time, as those rise and fall, you know, these places would all be connected and just walk in different places, right? But this is, but the channel is so deep, these are never connected. You have to disperse across. And it's a lot easier to walk than to fly across. And you can use for some birds, rivers can be boundaries, right? If they've evolved to not cross an open area, right? They surely sure could fly the thousand feet across, but they just behaviorally don't. So it becomes a barrier to them. Any questions about this? Yeah. See the lines from other groups of organisms. Um, so the Wallace line works from anything, not everything. And you can see, I mean, you know, there's connection here, connection here, but then here there's you know various. It's, it's always separated. So you can think about. You know, And I forget what the what what follows that upper line. Anyone know? I'll look that up in a minute. Okay. Now file geography is about dispersal. Okay. So <coughs> humans, where do we evolve? Africa. Right. So we evolved in Africa. And even today the most human diversity is within Africa. We have a genetic diversity and things like that. And then humans dispersed and spread out across the world. And so we can look at, you know, look at evidence here of humans spreading into North America and South America from Siberia. Right? Um, and so there's you know, various things evidence. And the big question right now is how quickly did people spread here? Right? Did we, you know, take boats along the coastline and move fast or walk and take it slower? Um, and it's actually an open area of research. Okay, so phylogeography. So we talked about you know different species on a tree. Right? We can zoom in, and within that single branch is actually more structure, right? Populations. And zoom again is more structure of you know, families integrating, right? And so there's different levels, and so most of the phylogenetic inference is over this level, but phylogeography is looking at Okay. 